Hi, I'm Austin from Kraft Crickets, Oregon's first licensed food grade cricket farm. Welcome to video two of our video series, Introduction to Cricket Farming. Today we're going to discuss getting started with your farm, determining which species the crickets should breed, and how to legally obtain them. In terms of species, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of cricket species found throughout the world. The difference between the species is oftentimes very subtle and hard to determine, hence we don't have a precise count on the number of species. However, that doesn't matter as there are really just two species that are bred widespread in the United States. And these are the same two species that the FDA has permitted people to process for food. First, there's a Cata domesticus, or the house cricket. And then there's Griotis sigillatus, also known as the tropical house cricket, or the banded cricket. My apologies for the misproper pronunciation of this. Now, based off of my informal surveys, most farmers breed a Cata domesticus, or the house cricket. A big reason for this is that the Aketa can get a bit larger than the Griotis. When you're selling crickets by weight, it makes sense to farm the larger cricket. Some people prefer the taste of Aketa. I personally find there's little difference in taste. To me, most of the difference in taste really just comes from the food that the crickets eat and from the way that the crickets were processed, not from the species themselves. However, there are people that swear that Aketa are better or that Griotis are better. I say there's probably no difference. So, why would someone want to breed Griotis sigillatus if they are smaller and they have a similar taste profile to Aketa domesticus? The main reason is the Denzovirus. This is a disease that impacts Aketa domestica and can easily wipe out an entire cricket farm in just a matter of days. This actually happened not too many years ago and many farms saw their entire populations die off. So, this is the main reason people select Griotis sigillatus as they are resistant to the virus. Now this doesn't mean that Griotis sigillatus can't get sick, and some other virus won't eventually impact the species, just as the Denso virus affects Aketa domestica. However, many people did get spooked by the virus and moved to this slightly smaller cricket. Now, even though there is the risk of this virus, many people do still prefer Aketa domestica. If you are vigilant and keep your farm clean and regularly sanitize your instruments, you should be fine. There is, of course, a risk. But apparently a lot of people are willing to take this risk and do just fine because, according to my informal survey, more people farm a kind of domestic. Now you may be saying, why don't I just raise both species? This would be a hedge in case one got sick. I would at least have the other one to fall back on. Now you can do that, but just be aware that Griotis sigillatus can carry the virus and pass it on to a kind of domestic. And even if you separate your crickets into separate brooders, the virus can travel in the dust and is often transmitted through dirty water dishes or water dishes that haven't properly been cleaned. So in other words, if you're planning on breeding both species, please be very vigilant and ideally raise them in segregated facilities where you use separate sets of utensils. Once you've picked a species of crickets, you need to buy some starter crickets. Now there are a few easy options. One, you can just find a fellow cricket farmer and ask for some of his crickets or eggs. It actually may be advantageous to get crickets bred near where you plan to farm your crickets because these crickets may have been bred to fit your environment or your climate. Now, if you don't have access to another cricket farm, don't worry, you probably do have access to a pet store. Most pet stores sell live crickets, and for as little as 10 bucks, you should be able to get hundreds of crickets. Now, just be sure that the store knows what type of cricket they have. I've learned not all stores know, and so it's great, especially if you can get some documentation for them to prove that you're getting the species of crickets that you want. Your third option is just to buy some crickets off the internet. There are a number of crickets that sell online, and if you're an Amazon Prime customer, you can even get free shipping. Now, I was initially hesitant about receiving any crickets in the mail, but sure enough, it worked fine. Um, as a test, I ordered about 500, and I would say 90% of them survived the shipping. And, but as they were live animals, I did have to go to the post office and pick them up. They didn't just get dropped off by the mailman right at my door. Lastly, if you are going to be raising crickets, you need to make sure it's okay in your community or in your state. The two species I discussed today are permitted to process as food in the United States, but you need permission in order to move these crickets across state lines, in the live form that is. If you're getting your starter crickets within your home state, there probably is no issue. However, if you plan on getting your crickets from out of state, you'll need to file a Form 526 or Form 526 with the United States Department of Agriculture. I know of no examples of the USDA rejecting a permit request for these species of crickets, but you want to be safe and have the paperwork done. 
The paperwork is required as a check to make sure that you are transporting something into the state that won't cause havoc. It won't be some invasive species that will destroy crops or spread disease. Crickets shouldn't cause that. You may also want to check with your local health inspector in case there's any special local laws that you need to be aware of. That's all I have today. Feel free to ask any questions in the comment section below. Otherwise, thank you for watching this video and please check YouTube for the rest of our video series.